every, every religion, and particularly in Christianity, beca- becomes, um, there becomes this great dilemma, right? What is man? Because for the first time, a theory has, uh, has arisen that has gained notoriety that redefines man in tremendous ways. And, uh, and so here, um, in fact, the 1925 Baptist Faith and Message, the, the first Baptist Faith and Message that was uh, put together by Southern Baptists, really was because of this. Um, something happened just up the road in the 1920s. Anybody remember what it was? Yeah, Bryan College, just right up the road from us in Tennessee. Um, was, was where you had um, the, the Scopes monkey trial. And, um, and so uh, it was a big deal for America. It was a big deal for the church that the, um, that the theory of evolution would be taught in public schools to our children. And uh, now um, most schools don't give any attention to the concept or the idea of biblical creation anymore. Um, so as, as amazing as, as it was, you know, I mean, it, just introducing that is what brought all of that about. And, you know, I remember when I was in, when I was in high school, so this would have been the late 90s, um, when we came to that, that point in science, uh, at public school, I remember there was a week given to evolution, and there was a week given to the, to the concept of theistic creation. Um, and uh, I just, I remember that. I remember that they gave, you know, a week to each thing as they went through the unit. And, and those, days are, those days are gone. I mean, now the only, the only place that, that our children and, and, and young people and, and where we're going to learn about biblical anthropology is going to be from the church. Um, we, we have to realize that is that you know, and, and, and we take that very seriously with our ministry to children and our ministry to students is that there is so much that the Bible teaches that for many of you that are older, in, in your upbringing, it was part of the culture. And so you were, you were given um, a biblical worldview just from the culture because the culture by and large had a biblical worldview on these things. Now, I'm not saying that it was perfect or it was great, but, but it was there. And now it's completely opposite, and what is taught as truth are those things that are completely against Scripture. And so when we think about anthropology, when we think about the doctrine of man, it may be something that you think, oh, this is easy. We, we all know this, but I'll, I'll tell you that this is the, the, the world... The world isn't really grappling with the concept of atonement or the nature of Jesus Christ. Those aren't questions that they're even thinking about right now. Does that make sense? But they are thinking about anthropology. They are thinking about what is man? What what is gender? What does it mean to be uh, made male and female? Where did I come from? What is my purpose? Why am I here? These These are the the heart questions that so many of our in our culture are asking and and are we surprised that they're asking that because because we're made in the image of god we reflect the image of god we 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 have um we we have within us a divine fingerprint and we've been taught young people have been taught this post-christian uh, generation has been taught there is no God. You are not special. You are nothing more than a lucky set of, of atoms. You're, you're a biological experiment that went right for now. Um, and so you can see why our world has these questions, can't you? You can see why this is such a big thing. So as we, as we think about anthropology tonight, as we think about the doctrine of man, I, I want you to keep those things in mind. Um, because it's not just a, it's not just a, a, a theological exercise in the abstract. It, it truly is what people are thinking about as they're trying to discover themselves. 
as they're trying to discover who they are and why they're here. And the Bible gives us that. And our statement of faith, as we talk about the doctrine of man, will tell us these things. So we'll look at that first. Um, this, is what, this is the Baptist faith and message, what it says. And then we'll uh, look at some Bible verses and we'll break it down, kind of the format we do every week. It says, man is the special creation of God, made in his own image. He, is, he created them, male and female, as the crowning work of his creation. The gift of gender is thus part of the goodness of God's creation. In the beginning, man was innocent of sin and was endowed by his creator with freedom of choice. By his free choice, man sinned against God and brought sin into the human race. Through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command, the command of God and fell from his original innocence whereby his prosperity inherit a nature and an environment inclined towards sin. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are under condemnation. Only the grace of God can bring man into his holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the creative purpose of God, the sacredness, the sacredness of human personality, or human, yeah, personality is evident in that God created man in his own image and in, and in that Christ died for man therefore every person every race possesses full dignity and is worthy of respect and Christian love and so there's a lot there let's uh, let's think about some bible verses before we we think on the particulars of that you know does the bible actually teach these things uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We've, we've looked at these verses uh, quite a bit this year as I've talked about uh, manhood and womanhood and, and God's creation on, on those occasions. Um, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so we are it's very clear that we are created very differently than everything else, right? What else did God create in his image in this way? Nothing. Only man. And we talked a little bit about the image of God um, when, when we talked about God, if you, if you remember, we talked a little bit about the Imago Dei. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Does anybody remember um, what we talked about when we, when we talked about those things? There's two, there's two concepts, and I believe both are true. I, some will hold to one, some will hold to the other. One concept is being created in the image of God has to do with our abilities, that we share communicable attributes of God. So uh, God has, God is, is all wise, right? We can possess wisdom. God is relational. We are relational. God, um, God is creative. We are creative. And thereby, the image of God in man separates us from everything else in that we uh, possess attributes in a way that God does that is different than all of creation, right? The problem with this, I think, if that's the only way that you define it, are, is that my dog can, cre can exhibit some of these things as well. Now, not to the same degree that I can, but she looks at me, and I, I'm pretty sure it's love. <laughs> she adores me, right? Y'all can say whatever you want to me, and it's fine. Because I go home, and my puppy, my dog adores me. Like, it's just the best thing. So, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but she's creative, right? I, I watch her sneak around and do stuff, and, and she can be creative. Um, she has knowledge and wisdom. She learns right? She even teaches me <laughs> so that I can do what she wants, <laughs> right? 
And, and so the problem that I see is if we think about the image of God only as those attributes, is that creation does reflect those attributes to a degree, and then it becomes very hard to distinguish what really is the image of God and not the image of God. The, the second thought on the image of God is that, that being made in the image of God is more of a declaration. God says we are in his image. God gives us the, the rule as he rules, right? So here it says, um, l- let them have dominion. And so we exercise with the authority as God would exercise because he has bestowed that upon us. Uh, I don't think either one of those is wrong. I actually think it's very good to think about the image of God in both those ways. There's a sense in which the image of God says man is sacred. Man's life is sacred. More so in a different way than anything else in creation, right? You can go, you can go kill and eat a deer and morally feel okay about it. You can even think it's yummy. If you go kill and eat a man then it's a very different set of consequences, right? Um, And so part of it is is that God has declared it, and the other sense is is that we do experience and see that attribute-wise, there is something special about man than all of creation. Even even what we might call the more higher beings, those that that show more intelligence and intellect, um, man is still... Uh, very different and much superior than that. Um, and so, so we see, first of all, that man is created in God's image. Um, uh, God made man and female. He made, he made, us, he made genders. Again, I've, I've talked about this a lot, so I'll go pretty quick here. Uh, it says, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. You know, part of that is the um, God created in the gender of man and in the concept of marriage and, um, and having Eve as a helper, you have not just, um, you have not just relations, like, you know, you all are my friends, right? We, we have, a, we're able to have a relationship together, but the relationship between a man and a woman and that fit is something much, much greater, right? And so that really does reflect the, the intimacy and the unity of the Trinity. Now, not, not the sexual side of it. Don't go there with me. But just, you know, I think, about, think about the fit. Um, you know, as we read the Bible, God the Father plans for salvation and sends the Son, the Son is obedient and comes and does the work of salvation. And then the Spirit applies salvation and sustains salvation within the individuals. And so you see just even within the role of the Trinity, you see this concept of, of help and fit for God's plan, for God's will and His purpose to come together. Do you see that? And so I think there's a sense in which we can look and see how God has made uh, man and woman, particularly in marriage and what marriage should be and reflect, and it reflects that fit. Um, it, it reflects the, the Trinity itself. Um, uh, Genesis 3. So everything was going good, right? Adam got a wife. He's kind of happy. Everything looks good. And then we get to Genesis 3, and it gets bad real quick. Right? So man, man was created in a state from which he fell. So man was created in a state of innocence and freedom, of true liberty, from which he disobeyed God and entered into a state that was different. Right? And we read about this in Genesis 3. And, and because of that, there is judgment. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking to, to, to Satan, to the serpent, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So again, this is, 
This is the, the, the proto-evangelion, the, the first gospel that we read all the way back at Genesis 3, right after the fall. We, we read this promise here of the seed of the woman, which will be Jesus, which is very interesting, the concept of the seed of the woman. You would never talk about that that way in the ancient world because it was always thought of that the children came from the seed of the man. And so seed of the woman is a very, very strange historical um, language, except for the fact that Mary was what? A virgin. There, was, there, there wasn't a seed of a human man. And so when you begin to see that, you begin to see these, these nuggets that God put in all the way back um, in the first book of the Bible. Um, and so, and then again, you see that there is a, uh, there is a, a wound, there is a, an injury that, it, that Satan delivers to the seed, but the seed, the one who comes from the woman, delivers a mortal blow to Satan. He crushes the head. Um, and of course, this is the picture of the gospel. And then there's judgment there also. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your, so- your, your sorrow and end your conception in pain. And you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. There's a lot of a lot of ink spilled over that last part about the desire for the husband, and he shall rule over you. I think real simply, what it means is your relationship is not going to have the balance and the fit that it was intended to have without sin. You are going to you are going to both jockey for position and and against each other in such a way that you will experience difficulty in marriage. Anybody experience difficulty in marriage? You're all liars. <laughs> um, and so we have a lot here that talks about uh, man. Genesis 9. So here we have this, um, this declaration of God that that man, is, there is something special about man over everything else. Whoever sheds the blood of man... By man his blood shall be shed, for, the, for in the image of God he made man. So there is a strict punishment and prohibition against murder that we read way before we get to Exodus 20 and the giving of the law. Uh, psalm 8, a beautiful psalm that talks about this. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angel. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under his feet. It, it really is a, a beautiful psalm when you sit and you think about it and what it means. And, you know, the, the lower than the angels. Angels are pretty awesome beings. They, they have uh, tremendously more capabilities and more power than we do. And yet... Were they made in God's image? No. Are they, are, are, are fallen angels redeemed? No. Um, you know, we, we know something that angels will never know, and that is the grace of God. God's love and his favor and his image is placed upon us in such a way that we are, even though they have greater capabilities than us, We seem to be favored and loved and esteemed higher by the Lord um, than even what angels are. Which is pretty awesome when you stop and you you think about it and think about God's love for for mankind, for us. Um, uh, Romans 5.12. So now we're going to talk a little bit about positionally in the New Testament. Um, There are, you, you can be found under Adam or in Christ, right? So in Adam or in Christ. We're familiar with this language, right? Uh, Romans 5.12 says, therefore, just as one man, sin entered into the world. Who's that? Adam, right? And death through sin, and thus death sped to all men because all have sinned. And then the argument will go on to talk about that there is 
that there is a man who redeems that you can be under, that you can be in Christ. You think about in Colossians particularly, Paul uses that phrase, in Christ, over and over and over again. And so we, we positionally, can our nature can be found in Adam or the redeemed nature can be found in Christ. And that's going to be real important as we, as we move on and, and consider, to think, consider these things. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3 kind of talks about this too. We've talked about this on, we talked about this on, uh, on Wednesday night uh, a few weeks back. One of my favorite passages in all of the Bible, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. And it says, and you have been made alive, you who were dead. Well, how were we dead? Because I was moving around, right? I was animated, but spiritually, I was dead to God. I was a spiritual zombie, right? I was dead spiritually to God, and that's what it'll say. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in, once, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. So, so that idea of the course of this world means... Satan's dominion. He'll go on and say it. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is now at the sun, in the work of the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So this tells us that unredeemed man... What is his nature? A nature of wrath, a nature of sinfulness, a nature uh, separated from God, a spiritual death, right? And that is the nature that we are born into in Adam. Um, all right, so let's talk about some observations from what we can, what we can see that the that the Baptist faith and message teaches theological observations. And the first is this, God, uh, the, it, it affirms very clearly that God created humans. Man is the special creation of God. Any concept of, of Darwinism and materialism does not find a foothold in our confession of faith. Um, it, it, it very clearly um, states that we are a special, unique creation of God, um, made, made by him for him. And so again, in the, in the history of America, this is huge. Unfortunately, I mean, it should be just as big for us today, but the reality of it is, is we've become so accustomed to uh, Darwinistic philosophy, not just, not just Darwinistic philosophy in its proper form, but Darwinistic philosophy is the foundation for just about every secular theory that there is. Um, you know, even as, as I was studying um, educational theory for my, for my doctorate, um, I, 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 uh, I did a, a self-study class on andragogy. So you may be used to the word pedagogy, which means the, uh, the teaching of children. Well, andagogy is the teaching of adults. Adults learn different than children. Um, and so often, why adults don't like to learn is because we try to teach them like children. And adults have unique learning abilities. And that's, that's observable, right? Um, a, child, a child you can teach abstractly because they don't have experiences. But adults have experienced stuff, and so if you don't tap into their experiences, they check out. Or if you try to teach them in a way, and they have an experience, and what you're saying is wrong, they're going to immediately just tune you out. You have no clue what you're talking about, right? Come on. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, even in that, even in that, I, I still remember when I studied that, you know, all of the, all of the philosophies and theories... The, the, the proper, you know, theories of these things, they are, they are describing observable truths. But they start with a foundation that basically says, as man has evolved, 
as his brain has evolved, as he has gone from a simple creature to a complex creature, he has developed these abilities. And so, um, so, so, so Darwinism, humanism, materialism, it, fi- it sneaks its way into just about everything in our society. It's very difficult to be a Christian, to be a, a Bible-believing Christian and work your way into the sciences. It is almost nearly impossible because, again, they have become so, they have become so, so set on foundations that are against what Scripture starts with that it becomes, it becomes nearly impossible. Anything in, anything in medicine is ruled by, uh, by materialism, by, by Darwinism, by evolution. Anything in, anything, you know, philosophical or, or behavioral is ruled by those things. Um, you know, you, you may be okay in engineering, <laughs> Because it, it has more to do with math, um, but uh, but so many fields, Christians are disappearing in these fields, and and the reason is is because when they they go to when they first start to get into these fields, it becomes very clear that it's going to be an uphold battle to be a person of faith in uh, amongst peers in this field. It, it's going to be an uphill battle to write papers that are acceptable because you don't believe the philosophical lies and foundations that they have, that they have um, placed on everything. And so, um, so again, while this kind of seems like not a big deal for us, we need to remember that this is a big deal. We also need to remember that more and more as we witness to young people, more and more as we as we, uh, we talk with them, they're coming from a, they're coming from a background where uh, creationism is like saying the earth is flat. Like, honestly, like, I mean, that's, that's what it's equated with, is that the concept of creationism is just as insane as my daughter, <laughs> Kyla, you guys don't, you guys, a few of you have met her when she came, but, um, she is the child that is most like me, and it's probably not a good thing. She, when she was in um, aircraft mechanics school, she, she started goofing off with everybody, and she, she started on this kick that birds are not real. Birds are just spy drones by the government. And she, and she, she was so consistent with it and would share things, you know, about birds aren't real. She, that, that she ha- actually had people in her class that were saying, you really think birds aren't real? Like, <laughs> like are you, do you really believe that? And, uh, and, and so I'm just telling you, you've got to remember, we're, we're goobers to the world. If you, believe, if you believe this, that man is the special creation of God, you are a goober to the world. Just as much as somebody that says the earth is flat. Um, and, and, and we have to it's not a position that we can change because the Bible doesn't allow us to. And it is one of those foundational things. You begin to change that. You change the meaning, the purpose of man. You change what it means to be in God's image. You change the concept of gender. You change, you change everything. And so um, we just have to remember that more and more, um, It might go away. It might come back. I don't know. That was a mean sneeze building up. Um, we might, you know, we, we, we just, we have to remember that. We have to remember that as we teach our children. We have to remember that as we teach our grandchildren. Um, you know, parents, grandparents. Um, listen, I, I, I homeschooled my children. That's the choice we made. It's not the choice and the best fit for everybody. I am not against schools. I am not against teachers. But As a Christian, you have a responsibility to make sure that you're teaching your children the things of God. As a church, we have a responsibility and we need to be cognizant, especially for our youth who are about to go to secular universities where they're going to be told, if you believe in God, you might as well say the earth is flat. 
we have to give them a foundation and understanding of what the Bible says, not just what our opinions are, but what the Bible says to prepare them to have faith, to prepare them if God calls them into one of these fields that it's very difficult to have faith in, that they will be equipped and ready and able to excel in those fields as a godly man and a godly woman. Um, so again, this is, a, this, is a, this is a point that might seem minute to us, but it's incredibly important. Um, second, humans are the image bearers of God. We, we've already talked about this. I won't talk much more about it. What's really interesting, though, is that, that humanity is the crowning work of God's creation. And ladies, the crowning, crowning work of God's creation is women, <laughs> right? Um, you know, as, as one little girl said once, uh, he, got it, he got it right, and so he stopped. Um, couldn't do any better. Uh, but, it, but it does show the uniqueness of God as, as there's a crescendo in creation that leads to the creation of man who is in his image, who bears the Imago Dei. Um, and who, who bears the image of God? All men, all women, not just the redeemed. All of us bear the image of God. The image of God can be tainted, it can be tarnished, but every person is worthy of respect and love and the gospel because we are all image bearers. Um, gender. So the Baptist Faith and Message in 2000, um, one of the things that, that our leaders saw on the horizon was that there was going to become a revolutionary change in the way that our culture thought about gender. Were they prophets? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so uh, the, these, these words were um, the, the 63 and the 25. The 25 doesn't talk about gender because in 1925, you wouldn't think that people would, would not be able to self-assess what gender was. <laughs> but by the time we get to the, to the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message, um, we decided that we needed to make a very clear um, comment about gender. Um, and, and we did that, and I am so glad and so thankful that we did. Um, it is, it is you, are, you are significantly out of step with the Southern Baptist Convention if you compromise on gender. If you give in to the ideology and you give in to what the world is doing right now, calling <laughs> pregnant people or that men can have babies, um, you, just, you, just have, you just have no room to be in fellowship with Southern Baptist churches because we had the forethought to make this very clear as the Bible makes clear. And so it says, says here that he created them male and female as the crowning work of his creation. And then this is, the, this is the key here. The gift of gender is thus part of the goodness of God's creation. And so the gift of gender and all that that means, it, it then goes to marriage and, and everything else. Uh, I, I remember in the early 2000s, churches were frantic. And I think our church, in our bylaws, we have an amendment that's one of these. Churches started to get frantic because state conventions and stuff were saying, if you don't state very clearly um, two genders, man and woman, then, then you might, you know, somebody might, it was, it was when the whole cake baking thing started, right? Somebody might come in and ask for marriage and you can't do it and, and you're going to get in trouble. Well, we actually were never in trouble if we adopted the Baptist faith and message because our statement of faith very clearly states that we believe what the Bible says and that, that not just that there's male and female, but that it is a part of the goodness of God's creation. It is a deeply held religious belief, to use the, the, the language that the government looks for when they decide such things. It is a deeply held religious belief that we hold that gender is male and female, and that it is the gift of God, and that it is to be celebrated, and quite frankly, to, um, to try and undo that is to 
go against God. It is to doubt God's goodness and to doubt God's um, purpose. Does that make sense? It's one of those things that, you know, why, there, there are certain things that, that you know, we, we, we have this saying, sin is sin. And yes, sin is sin. But there are some sins that are weightier than other sins. Jesus makes this explicit. Jesus said, what, you remember what Jesus says about those who would cause a little one to stumble? It'd be great, it'd be better for a millstone to be tied around their neck. Um, you know, Jesus is saying in that that there is something weightier about being abusive and causing a child to sin than an adult. Um, and, and so, and we know this. Um, of course, you know, murder is is a greater sin than theft. Um, and so this con- we have this concept and idea in popular Christianity that says, well, just sin is sin, and it doesn't matter. You know, you, you worry, you're so worried about this, why aren't you worried about this? Well, there is different weights, and, and the concept of uh, homosexuality and the sin, against, um, the sin against gender is a, is a sin whereby you identify your entire being at odds with God and his created order. Does that make sense? So um, if I lie, I do something, I I can tell a lie, right? But if I redefine myself in such a way to despise God, in such a way to... um, to deny him and his goodness and his order, then all of my being is constantly in that sin. Does that make sense? Do, do you see um, how that works? And so, so again, we have a very clear statement on this. Um, this is something that um, our churches, by and large, Southern Baptist churches, again, we are we are independent. We network together, but by and large, this is not something that we really um, contend with. Praise Jesus. And part of it is because we've been very clear to state what the Bible says in our Baptist faith and message. Um, humans experience corruption because of sin. So, so what I mean by this is in the garden, the original creation, man was sinless. Man was in a state of innocence that was unique to that moment. Uh, this is what it says. In the beginning... Man was innocent of sin and was endowed by his creator with freedom of choice. By his free choice, man sinned against God and brought sin into the human race. And so, um, notice it uses the, the wording free choice and not free will. The, the, the concept and the idea that we often have when we use the, the terminology free will is quite sloppy. It really is um, a Catholic doctrine. It has to do uh, more with Catholic theology, the concept of free will. And so I, I want to take, well, I thought I had it here. Um, here it is. We'll, we'll go ahead and talk about it here and then, and then go back. I want to I talk to you about the nature of man and the ability of man's will, the way that the Scripture talks about it, just to help us to understand, to think theologically um, ab- about w- what this means. Uh, because a lot of times it's used, it's used pretty sloppy. And, and we get the idea almost of the secular idea sometimes that they have of Christianity. You know, you, get the, you got the angel on one shoulder and then you got the devil on the other shoulder trying to tell you what to do, right? As though they're equally influencing you and equally powerful to you. Uh, but this is, what, this is what God's Word teaches us as we think about theologically about the state of man before God and the state of man's ability and his volition, his, his will, his, his abilities. And so we have the original state. This is the garden. This is Adam and Eve. This is pre-sin. And they had the power not to sin. They had a, a non-sinful nature. They didn't have an influence and a nature that was compelling them to sin. They were completely, truly neutral, but they were able to sin, right? 
And so this is, in, in, in a true term, the essence of truly what free will would be. That there's no inclination, there's no environment of sin, but there is the ability to rebel and do so. And they were tempted, but they were, they were tempted and allowed the temptation to overcome them. Satan, God, God doesn't go to Satan and say, you didn't give them the ability not to, right? No, he, 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 um, he judges Satan for the sin that he commits, and he judges uh, woman and man for the sin that they, uh, that they, by their own choice, unhindered by any other influence, take and do. And so, so that's where truly where the concept of free will is. And the reason why, again, that we use this word kind of in a sloppy way is because we don't have it again after that. Adam and Eve are the only ones that have it in that sense of truly free will, of that kind of true freedom and innocence of sin and ability to sin. Um, because then after Adam, we are all in Adam. Adam's sin passes to each of us, Right? And so we are born under the bondage of sin. We are slaves to sin, the Bible will talk about. We are, the, the state there is unredeemed. And the unredeemed are unable not to sin. They only have the power to sin. Now, that might seem judgmental and mean, but that's what God's Word says. All your righteousness is as Filthy rags. You see, the unredeemed, unregenerate man, even in his attempts to please God, is nothing more than an attempt to be self-righteous. Is an attempt to subvert God and an attempt to prove his own goodness to which he does not hold. And thereby, men need redemption. Our message is not to go clean yourself up, to go pick yourself up, to go do good works and give money to the poor. That is not the message of Christianity because you could do every one of those things and be in hell. There will be men in hell who were great philanthropists, who gave away large sums of money, who did incredible works of good to society, but they did not have righteousness. That's the whole dilemma of Romans. How can we be righteous? How can we be made righteous? And it's only through Jesus Christ. Because all that we try to do in the unredeemed state is bound. Our will is bound. Incredible book to read about this is Martin Luther's book, The Bondage of the Will. Martin Luther and Erasmus, who was a, uh, a Catholic priest... Erasmus was, was trying to put the, the Catholic understanding of the volition of the will and arguing with Martin Luther, who was giving a scriptural uh, understanding of the bondage of the will. And so it's a very accessible book, uh, and it's very enlightening. But, but Martin Luther's The Bondage of the Will is, is an incredible uh, read to, to understand this. But then we have a, another state, right? We can be saved. We can be redeemed. Right? And so when we're redeemed, we now have the ability not to sin. We still have a sin nature. We're still in the flesh. We're still bound to that old man. But because of the influence of Christ, because of the righteousness of Christ, because of the knowledge of Christ, we have the ability now not to sin. So we can sin, but we have the ability not to sin. And so, so this is called the liberated will. Um, in Christ, but we're still tempted, we're still able to sin. And what we look forward to in heaven, at the state of glorification, is another change in the will of man, that we are not able to sin. So in heaven, we will not be able, heaven will be different than the, the garden where Adam and Eve had the ability to sin, in heaven we will be fully redeemed and we will be unable to sin. There is no, there, there's no cyclical, cyclical uh, pattern that will get to heaven, new heavens, new earth, new creation. It's almost like a new garden, right? And then 
oh man, we're starting over again. That's not, that's not what's going to happen. We will remain in the state of the redeemed. We will be perfected. We will have a perfected will whereby we always will do what God commands. What God, our will will always align with God's will. Does that make sense? Again, I, I, I try not to be too persnickety when I hear people talk about free will in, in really bad ways. But this is truly the way that the Bible talks about man's ability. As we think about man and as we think about the change in the nature of man um, and, and the ultimate goal of God for the state of glorification. And that makes us look forward to heaven, doesn't it? I mean, not only will the place be perfect, but we will be perfected. We will be changed. We will be different. Um, okay, so with that, that helps us to think about some of these other things that, that are said here. Um, I went the wrong way. I needed to back up to this one. Okay, so humans after Adam have a sinful nature. That's what we just talked about. And this is what, the, this is what it says. It says, uh, through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the commandment of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his prosperity, his children, his offspring inherit a nature and an environment that's inclined towards sin. So sin not only affected humanity, sin also affected our environment. Sin affected everything. Everything bears death and dying. It bears the, uh, the impact of sin that we experience in this world because sin affected all of those things. And, and so again, our inclination then, our nature is towards sin. This, this concept of original sin, um, of inherited guilt from Adam, is, is actually very um, contentious today in many theological circles. Um, a few years ago, the, the PCUSA, the, um, the, the, the liberal Presbyterian group, the mainline Presbyterian um, denomination in America, uh, went to the Gettys because in Christ alone, it talks about inherited guilt. It talks about original sin in that song. And they, they went to the Gettys because they said, we love that song. One of the greatest songs of, of our day is in Christ alone. And so they went to the Gettys, who were the, the writers, and they owned the rights to the song, and they, they said, we'd like to offer a, uh, a, different, um, a different set of words that we can put in our hymnals that don't talk about original guilt because we don't, we don't believe in that. And, uh, and they said, too bad. <laughs> if you're going to sing the song, you can't change the theology. Um, so good on them, right? And, uh, but, but this is... This is one of those uh, doctrines that, um, that has become very contentious amongst um, liberal Christianity, is that, uh, that, that we have, that we're bound to sin, that we have inherited a guilt. Um, now, here's, here's where I want you to be careful and where I think we need to be careful. The Bible, in, in all my study, I've never seen a place where the Bible attributes God's wrath and punishment only to our inherited guilt. And it doesn't have to because as soon as we're able to sin, we sin. And then we actively participate in that sin, right? Um, and so we won't, we won't get into it much tonight, but I think that that's a, the theological basis for the concept and idea of uh, the salvation of infants and the salvation of those who mentally cannot come to a, a point to where they can clearly perceive uh, the attribute and the nature of God, to, to tie it together with Romans 1. And, uh, and because, again, God never condemns us just for being born in Adam. No, we very quickly, because we're born in Adam, participate in sin as Adam did. We not only inherit his guilt, but we perform acts of sin that, that are what brought the original guilt on. Um, and so that's why it says this. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, 
So this concept and idea of moral action, this then addresses the idea of of what we could talk about, those who are infants or those who are are mentally incapable. Um, They become transgressors, and they are under condemnation as transgressors. Um, Man needs to experience the redeeming grace of God. So, we, so, so, so far, it's been bad news, right? God made us great. He made us special. And we've just messed it all up. But only the grace of God can bring man into a holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the, the creative purpose of God. So we must experience the grace of God. We must experience redemption. Our greatest need is that of redemption. We talked about that a little bit this morning. I don't think I need to stress it with you, but, but we clearly state that, that that is the need that every man has is to be redeemed because every man is separated by, from God by birth naturally under the bondage of sin, spiritually dead. Um, the Baptist Faith and Message celebrates the sacredness and the dignity of human life. Um, from, from the womb to the tomb, the Baptist Faith and Message is very clear about these things. Uh, the sacredness of human personality is evident in that God created man in his own image and that Christ died for man. Therefore, every person... Every race possesses full dignity and is worthy of respect and of Christian love. We'll have a, a statement on the social order, which is a, an amendment that, an, an amendum that comes in 1998 to the 1963 and really is the impetus for why we decided to go through and redo the entire 1963 uh, to the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message, but it's, it's, it'll be one of the last things that we look at that, that talks about the social order and culture, and it'll spell these things out more clearly, that, that we as a uh, convention do not condone uh, racism, that we do not condone ageism, that we uh, do not condone sexism, um, that, that, that all individuals are worthy of dignity, and of life, and of goodness, and of the gospel, because they are created in the image of God. From the smallest, most vulnerable, to the oldest, most vulnerable, and everything in between. And so the the moral complexities that our world is wrestling with, such as abortion, and euthanasia, those really shouldn't be moral qualms for us as a people of the book, as a people who understand um, that God gives life, God sustains life, and God has a day and a moment where life ends. And he is active in all of those things. He is the giver of life. He is the sustainer of life. And so we don't want to interfere in those things. Now, science gives us quandaries. You know, you, you have individuals who, who are, you know, they become brain dead, but they're, um, they're medically viable. And then you begin to discuss you know, what, what's happening. Those are, those are hard decisions that, that, that wise pastors are very helpful to, to families to think through those things because sometimes, sometimes the scientific community just gives us really bad stuff. I mean, the, the reality of it is is that we're able to live uh, longer than we should um, in so many circumstances and scenarios because of the advancements of science. And so there are moral and ethical challenges sometimes that come into that. And, um, and we need to be considerate and thoughtful of that. But as a general, we are a people of life. We are a people of, of that, that all humans are worthy of life and should be able to have life. And not only have life, but have the gospel. 
that they can experience eternal life and know the true uh, life, the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, that's the last slide right at 6 o'clock. That's pretty impressive. Is there, is there any questions or, or, or quick thoughts that you might have as we think about anthropology, about the, the doctrine of man? Um, there's a lot there, isn't it? And, and again, we take, it, we take it for granted, but we need to be very clear on these things. And, 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 and we, need to, we need to re-engage in the culture in clear, compassionate um, ways. Because what's happened is the culture has turned to Christian compromisers. To individuals that will compromise on these things that the Bible are very clear about. That, that's who the news media goes to, to try to say, oh, not all Christians believe this. Oh, not all Christians believe the Bible teaches this. Well, all of these things that we've looked at, these are not um, obscure, delicate theological arguments. They're just not. They're very clear things that the Bible states. Um, and so uh, we must also hold firm to these things as our world questions, changes, and uh, redefines these things because it is necessary, again, for us to understand who we are, our position before God, and what it is that we need. We need salvation. And all of those things are questions of, of anthropology. Yes? So when people are running into an and we tell them that they are Right. Often, yes. And, and so we'll talk about that next time. That is the nature of sal- That is the doctrine of salvation. <laughs> uh, we need redeemed. How can we be redeemed? What is, it, what is it that that redemption does to us? How is it that we are changed from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive? And, and so we'll, we'll look at that the next time that we, we look at salvation. Yep. All right, well, if there's nothing else, then I will pray and we'll be dismissed for the night.